Hey folks, Amy Perlman here. I'm a urologist in Iowa City, Iowa at the University of Iowa. And I have Dr. Moet Kira here and he's at Baylor College of Medicine. I had the distinct privilege of working with Dr. Kira when I was a medical student, a lowly medical student at Baylor College of Medicine uh, just a few years ago. Dr. Kira, say hello to the crew. Hello, thank you very much for the invitation. And Amy, you were the best medical student we have ever had. Uh, honestly. <laughs> That's on the recording, right? <laughs> You were, you were amazing. You published so much with us. So uh, definitely, definitely made an impression. So we are celebrating the Urology Times 50th year anniversary. And as part of this initiative, we're talking about innovations in urology. And, and while there are so many innovations that have occurred, I think testosterone therapy is one of the greatest innovations that has not only occurred within urology, but perhaps within healthcare. So Dr. Kara, in terms of testosterone and innovation, what makes this advent of testosterone therapy in men a top innovation in urology? So, you know, when, when patients think about testosterone, they think about bodybuilding and lifting weights, but the reality is that testosterone affects almost every facet of our body. It affects our bones in terms of bone mineral density. It affects some bits of cognition. It affects endogenous testosterone, it affects fertility. It's very important in making sperm. We know that it's important for erectile dysfunction, libido, muscle mass, fat deposition. We know that it can help with patients with anemia, increases erythrocytosis in, in a positive way for those patients. So there are many benefits of testosterone. We also know that testosterone stimulates stem cell production within the bone marrow. So it's not just about bodybuilding and erections. It's really about all facets of men's health. I hear ya. So let's talk about how testosterone therapy has been, has been part of that innovation in urology. And one of the biggest ways is how our thinking has changed in terms of its safety and efficacy in special populations. So let's talk about the use of exogenous testosterone in men with prostate cancer. Great question. So I'll have to put this in the context of a story. When I started my residency and my fellowship, my fellowship was in 2006, we were taught that testosterone was dangerous. In fact, that testosterone may increase the risk of prostate cancer, particularly in men who've had a history of prostatectomy. Slowly after several publications, we started realizing that it may not be as dangerous. And later on, we started seeing studies coming out showing that testosterone may actually have a protective role. In other words, those men who had normal testosterone levels were much less likely to have a biochemical recurrence than those patients who had low testosterone levels. And in 2015, the most fascinating studies came out of John Hopkins by Dr. Dan Mead's group, where he's using high doses of testosterone combined with antiandrogen called bipolar androgen therapy to, in men with metastatic prostate cancer. Now, can you imagine, Amy, giving men with metastatic prostate cancer testosterone to help reduce the PSA and decrease metastatic uh, disease? Unheard of 15 years ago, but those are the trials that are going on. In fact, Dr. Dan Mead recently published a study this year called the Transformer Study comparing enzalutamide, which is the standard of care in men with castrate resistant prostate cancer versus high doses of testosterone, same efficacy. Can you imagine? Same efficacy. So again, really some mind changing, paradigm changing events that are going on with testosterone. And we were told that by adding testosterone to these regimens, it's like adding fuel to the fire. So when it comes to testosterone and those with prostate cancer, really we've be, it's it's turned a 180 completely different no longer harmful but perhaps protective in certain populations i i agree and i would say that i would say that intuitively i believe that but i would tell you that i just want to go back to the aua guidelines the aua guidelines are very clear in 2018 men should be notified that testosterone therapy does not increase the risk of prostate cancer and that is a strong recommendation by the aua however in men with a history of prostate cancer, radical prostatectomy, uh, radiation, the risk-benefit ratio has not yet been defined. In other words, we don't know. So on paper today, it is inconclusive until we have more trials. Now, I will tell you that if you survey physicians from 2005 to 2021, uh, many physicians are treating patients with a history of radical prostatectomy and radiation. Our comfort level has gone up. But again, I do want to use some caution that we do need a randomized placebo control trial to really assess the true safety. I hear you. Now let's talk about testosterone in those with heart disease. So something similar where our thinking about, you know, adding testosterone in these patients has completely changed. Uh, how has that been innovated over, you know, the last 50 years? 
The paradigm has shifted. So when we started, uh, if you look before 2010, the majority of the studies suggest that giving testosterone to men did not increase the risk of a cardiovascular event. In fact, many of those studies show that giving testosterone may decrease the risk factors for a heart attack, such as diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome. However, in 2010 to 2014, there were several studies that suggested that testosterone may increase cardiovascular risk. There were only four studies, and suffice it to say, there are some limitations, significant limitations with those studies. But as since those studies, the FDA has mandated or required or requested a large 6,000 patient randomized placebo-controlled trial called the TRAVERSE trial. That study is set to end next year in June of 2022, and the primary endpoint is MACE, and I'm very excited about those results. Awesome. Now, lastly, let's talk about innovations with testosterone delivery and formulation. So when you started, you know, you, you said in the, in the mid 2000s, what formulations were you using then? And what are the options now? It's amazing. This field has exploded. So when I started, there were only two gels. We either gave patients Androgel or we gave them Testum. That's all we had. And we would give them injections and we try not to use the patches. And if you just think about what's happened in the past 15 years, it, it's exploded. So 2008 came Testapel. Then we said Aved came out, long acting injectables. We now have a tremendous amount of gels, intranasal gels, under the arm gels, uh, inner thigh gels, shoulder gels. They're gels throughout the, that we can apply throughout the body uh, that have been very effective. Now we have oral medications that have come out. We now have one oral medication in the market. The second one is set to come out in March of 2022. And even a third one is set to come out as well. So patients have a lot of choices, a lot of choices between what fits their lifestyle. Um, and you can see that that's, this field really has exploded. Yeah. So Mo, let's summarize here. When it comes to the last 50 years of innovations in urology and in healthcare, testosterone is definitely at the top. And what I'm hearing from you is that it's drastically changed how we use testosterone in terms of special populations. And while the research is still ongoing and we still have a lot more to learn, our initial thinking was wrong. And, and that has just changed even over the last 10 to 15 years. So wow, wow, what an exciting field. And then in terms of how we deliver testosterone, so many different options here. Uh, is there anything else you want to add to that discussion? I completely agree with you. And I think one important thing, Amy, that we should always just realize is that giving testosterone to men is a natural contraceptive. So it's unfortunate, but many patients will come to our clinics and someone has put them on testosterone and they say, I didn't know I could become infertile right? So giving testosterone can cause infertility, but raising a man's own natural endogenous testosterone is very effective, not only in, in keeping the testosterone levels higher, but also protecting the fertility. We have medications to do that, whether it be Clomid, HCG, and Nasazole, but we also know that lifestyle modification can also increase testosterone levels, losing weight. In fact, 10% weight loss can increase testosterone by almost 95 nanogram per deciliter, 15% weight loss increases almost to 250 nanogram per deciliter. So weight loss, improving sleep apnea. Um, these are things that can significantly improve testosterone naturally. So I think we really want to don't undermine the importance of the infertility population and the young hypogonadal patient. So I think the even more important point is the innovation is understanding that testosterone is critical. And whether it's giving someone exogenous testosterone or educating them in a way to help optimize their own testosterone production, perhaps that is the real innovation is just understanding the importance of hormones in men. You, you're so right. And I would tell you that the way of the future, and you, these studies have also gone, is to help men make their own endogenous testosterone in more creative ways. The most exciting studies I've seen are with stem cells, taking latex stem cells, injecting them back into the testicular tissue and having that man once again produce his own testosterone. I don't think we're far away. I think we'll see this in this lifetime, but that to me is a very exciting field in, in, in testosterone. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, we look forward to all the work that's coming out of your lab. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Amy.